Great. Go ahead and be seated. I'm going to welcome you to DC, to DC Regional Christian Church. Uh, what a great way to be able to uh, uh, have uh, uh, to start this message to, to um, uh, then to see our sister uh, be immersed into Jesus Christ. If you're a guest here today, we want to welcome you. It's great to have you here with us today. If you see a lot of friendly people wanting to shake your hand and give you a hug, just go ahead and let them. We, we really enjoy fellowshipping with one another. And we hope that you stick around and get a chance to, to meet more of us. We want to make you feel at home here today in our congregation. Now let's go to our Father in prayer. We have some great things to talk about in God's Word today. Let's pray to our Father. Our Father, as we just bow our heads right now and as we approach you collectively in prayer, we ask you, Father, to just really fill this place and fill our hearts with your presence Father, encourage us, spur us on, inspire us, lead us, Father. We give you our hearts. I pray that we will, uh, the act of listening right now will be a worship service to you. The act of attentively waiting for you to speak to us, Father, will be accepted in heaven as an act of worship as well. So we pledge in advance to obey the scriptures we read so that we can glorify you in a great way. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's church say amen. Amen and amen. You know, today we are going to continue something that we left off on last week. Last week we, we started a, 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 actually we're in a, a, a study series about being invested. You know, we start the year off talking about the Holy Spirit. And then we, we're sliding on into uh, this term invested. And today, um, like last week, we're going to talk about Caleb. We're going to talk about the wholehearted faith of Caleb, part two. If you, now, if you weren't here last week, we introduced um, the church to this character named Caleb. And he's a great Old Testament character. Moses has sent out 12 people to spy the land, to be able to see whether, uh, to just be able to, to, to take a look at at where, where God was going to lead them into the promised land. And only two out of, the, out of the 12 people that were sent came back with faith, came back with a sense of God is, will certainly give us this land. One of those two uh, was Caleb. The other was Joshua. Now, as we picked up the story, Caleb basically silenced all the naysayers that said we can't advance into the promised land because the enemies were too great. Their problems were too great. Even though the opportunity was great, they saw the problems instead of the opportunity. But Caleb and Joshua had a conviction in their heart that God's promises were greater than their problems. And that's one of the things that we came away with is we have to trust in the promises of God. And when we trust in God's promises, those promises can eliminate all the things that oppose us. And one of the three things that oppose us in our lives is fear, doubt and worry. Those are some great enemies. Fear, doubt and worry. And as we move forward, we see that Caleb was able to say, we can certainly see God's vision and promises come true in our life. Now we pick up at the end of the story. Israel has crossed into the promised land and uh, they are now engaging in great battles. And now we're going to fast forward 45 years. Up until that time, God had wiped out all of the generation of people who did not believe that God could fulfill his promises. So 45 years later, the only two people that were alive from that generation, the oldest people in Israel at that time were Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. 45 years later, as they are now seeing God's vision come true. And we're going to take a look at the wholehearted faith of Caleb, part two. Turn your Bibles over to Joshua chapter 14. This is where we're going to pick up here this morning. Joshua chapter 14. And the Bible says in verse 6, Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kizanite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me? 
I was 40 years old when Joshua, when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought back a report according to my convictions. I brought back to him a report according to my conviction. Here is Joshua and Caleb having a, good, a, a real good kind of conversation. And they're reflecting upon what happened over 40 years earlier. Caleb is talking. He says, man, when we were sent out, when I was 40 years old, when I was sent out, man, I came back with a report according to my convictions. You know, ironically, um, in 2003, when we restarted D.C. Regional Christian Church as a separate congregation, uh, apart from uh, um, um, a larger congregation, which we sprung out of, in 2003, we, we can actually record and, uh, and kind of uh, start the clock over in terms of the beginning of our church. During that time, I was 40 years old, personally. I was 40 years old. And I had a conviction. I had a conviction. You know, my, my convictions were, were not to do what everybody else was doing during that time. My conviction as a minister was, you know what, God can give us. He can, he can, he can bless us in ways that we don't even know. But in order to see God's blessings come true, we're going to have to believe that God will be with us. And we set out with a conviction to follow the cloud and not the crowd. That was a conviction that God placed on my heart when I was 40 years old, that we were not going to be limited by human reasoning or human organizations. We didn't want to be limited by what our minds can see, but we wanted to see what God can do in our life. We wanted to trust God and follow the cloud. Follow the cloud is mysterious it's in the sense that you don't necessarily know where God's going to go. Our conviction at that time was we're just going to go whatever way God says we need to go. And if, if we see the cloud lift, well, that was going to be our signal that we're going to have to go. And that cloud took us away from legalism. That cloud, that, that cloud lifted and moved and, 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 and put us in the land, I believe. Give us an opportunity to do some great things. Now, there's a, there's a lot of people who were here in 2003, many of you, and I praise God for you. At the same time, during this past journey, many, many people aren't here. Some moved away, some quit. But to those who are still here, who can remember that vision, I praise God for you. Because it just wasn't a conviction that I had. It was conviction that we had collectively. It was collective vision. We had to have convictions. And that's what Caleb said. Caleb said, man, when Moses sent me out, man, I brought back a report according to my convictions. I love that phrase. According to my convictions. You know, God wants us to have individual convictions about him. We can't borrow the convictions of our parents. We can't borrow the convictions of our, our pastors and our priests and, and, and uh, our, our people that we admire, our ancestors. We have to have our own convictions. When we stand before God on Judgment Day, he's not going to ask us, well, what did your church teach? He's going to ask us, what do we believe? And what did you do? What are your convictions? Are you wholehearted? Do you have your own deep convictions about God? Deep convictions about the scriptures? Deep convictions about the mission that God has given us. Deep convictions about the church and building up God's kingdom. Well, Caleb is one of our heroes because this is exactly what he did when he was 40 years old. In verse 8, he says, But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. You were invested. You were invested. This is where the theme that comes up for this series is, is being invested. That's another way, or another way to say that is to be wholehearted, but to be invested means you are all in. 
You are all in. There's, you're not holding anything back. You are totally in. It's as if when you're playing poker and, 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 and you know you have a good hand and you, you, you have your, your stack of chips, but because you know that you're going to win, you go, listen, I'm going all in. You take all of your chips and you put it right, right there in the middle of that pot and you just wait to see if your opponent's gonna go all in with you. You hope that they do, or you hope that they invest their chips, but you, you, you're you hoping that they do. When you know you have a good hand, you go all in. I'm here to say, we know we got a good hand because God is with us, therefore we ought to go all in. We push the chips. We, we, we're holding nothing back. We're wholehearted in our commitment. We're not saving a little bit just for a rainy day. We're all in. When God calls us to follow Jesus Christ, God calls each one of us to go all in. Our sister Etta said, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm giving up everything to follow Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important than him. I'm all in. And when you were baptized into Jesus Christ, you said the same thing. You said, I am all in. There's nothing I'm going to hold back. There's nothing more important than my love for God. There's nothing more important. Your children, your spouse, your friends, your job, your, your bank account, nothing except Jesus. Caleb said, I follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly. And that's really the challenge. If you've been living as a wholehearted disciple, I praise God for you. If you haven't, this is just an opportunity for you to investigate and examine your heart and make a pledge that God help me to be all in. Help me to be wholehearted. The parts of me that I have neglected to give over to you, uh, that's my prayer is that you will give that over to God so that you can be all in. If you're on the fringe, looking in, seeing wholehearted people, my, my prayer for you is to, to no longer be on the fringe of the church, but to be in the core, in the involved ministry of the church. Not being an observer from a distance, but being all in. We need everybody in this congregation to be wholehearted in their devotion to Jesus Christ. Being all in like Caleb. Like Caleb. This was his conviction. The Bible continues in verse 10. It says, now then, just as the Lord promised... He has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said to this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old, 85 years old. He goes on and says, I'm still as strong today. I'm still strong. 85, 85, you know, to go from 40 to 85. That 45 years, Caleb saw a lot. Caleb saw the earth swallow God's opponents. Caleb saw people, uh, snakes being uh, uh, sent out amongst God's people as a punishment, killing off people. Caleb saw water come from a rock. Caleb saw manna on the ground. Caleb saw enemies fall. You know what? Within a 45 year span of a walk with Jesus Christ through the wilderness, you're going to see a lot. Sometimes the more you see, it could discourage you. But it didn't discourage Caleb. It just got him that much more excited about his relationship with God. Caleb didn't see the problems and, and, cause, and, and those problems caused him to be defeated. Caleb just saw all the uh, challenges and as opportunities for God to even get that much more glory. 85 years old. And he was on fire for God. He wasn't ready to retire yet. 85 years old. You know, there, have you guys heard about this commercial? It was, it was played during the um, Super Bowl this past year. It's basically called, um, it's an E-Trade commercial. It's actually a pretty frightening commercial because it really tells a lot about really what's uh, the condition of, of many of our finances. And the issue is, um, if you don't invest early in your life, when it comes to retirement time, you're going to have to still work. 
you're going to have to still work. And it's an E-Trade commercial, basically trying to get people to invest now so that they can retire earlier or they can actually retire later. But to invest now. You know, this, this, this commercial is actually funny but frightening. It's a combination of two. Um, the, the funny part is they, 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 they describe these older uh, uh, elderly people still working their jobs. You know, one's, one's works as a tech support person, one's, one's as a lifeguard. There's a couple other, other, other different things. Not because they wanted to work, but because they didn't have enough invested, they had to work. And it was, I think it was the, the song that's playing in the backdrop of the commercials, one of Harry Belafonte's songs. Like, at the day -o, day -o. Have you guys remember that commercial? <laughs> And it starts off, I, I, I think, I think I, I try to write down the first line. It's like, I woke up early and I put on cologne. I'm 85 and I want to go home. <laughs> and they continue, you know, working tech support on a new iPhone. And this is an older guy just having these young people around. And it goes, I'm 85 and I want to go home. Deo, Deo. And then the, the funny line, I love this line. It says, I just got a job as a lifeguard in Savannah. I'm 85 and I want to go home. And then the next line is, and this is probably the, the funniest one. It says, I'm dropping six beats and they call me DJ Nana. <laughs> I'm 85 and I want to go home. And it's just funny. It's a funny commercial. I think it's a great commercial. But Caleb, when he was 85, he didn't want to go home. Caleb wasn't ready to retire and go home. Not Caleb. When he was 85, he says, I'm just getting started. I'm not trying to retire. I'm just as vigorous now as I was when Moses sent me out when I was a spry 40. We pick up in verse 11, it says, I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. 85, and I am not ready to go home. He says, verse 12, now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. I don't care about no Anakites. I don't care about no Nephilim. I don't care about no Goliaths. I don't care about no challenges. I said, well, Caleb, you're 85, and I'm not ready to go home. I'm ready to fight. I'm just getting started. Why? I'm wholehearted. Why? I'm invested. If we interviewed him, that's exactly what he was saying. I would love, he's one of my favorite characters. There's not a whole lot written about him, but what's written about him is so inspiring. Because it gives all of us hope of what our faith should look like as a regular disciple. You know, some people think that the older you get, okay, now, now it's time to take a break spiritually. I'm saying the more you get, the, more, the older you get, the more fired up you ought to be. Can I get an amen at that point? The older you get, the more fired up you ought to be. Sometimes it frustrates our young people because they see older disciples kind of taking it easy, talking about the glory days. And it doesn't really inspire young people because they go, how come you don't share your faith anymore? Well, I did that earlier on. Well, why aren't you willing to just sacrifice and plant churches? Well, you got to understand, we did that when we were in our 20s and college. And let me tell you more about how awesome I used to be. <laughs> and young people are never inspired by that. And some of us, we're still living back in the, in the glory days. 
You're still looking back on your life, looking back at periods in your life, in your 20s, and you're reflecting, saying, oh, man, remember how great it was? Remember how great it used to be? We used to get up early. We used to go share our faith. We used to do this. We used to do that. If Caleb entered your little small group discipling time, Caleb would challenge you. and says, I can't believe you guys are retiring. You give me the hill country. Now, there's more land that could have been conquered. The Negev. The Negev. The Negev is like the valley. That downhill fighting. Where you have the advantage. You're looking down on your opponents. And you can come and wipe them out easier. You could have gone to the plains and amassed your armies and have fought all the different enemies. But Caleb said, no, that hill country, that's where I want to go. Don't make it easy on me. I know it's uphill. I know they get the better vantage point. But that's where I want to go. You give me that hill country. And I'm going to take it down. It doesn't make a difference. We're going to win. Caleb in his 40s said, we can certainly do it. In his 40s. Caleb when he's 85, is still saying, we can certainly do it. Now, Now compare your faith to Caleb. Stop. Think. Where are you at? Can I just get a quick show of hands of, if you got a four in front of your name, your 40s, 40s. Can you raise your hand if you're in the 40s? I don't care if you're 49, you're in your 40s. <laughs> you're in your 40s. You're in your 40s. Man, you guys are spry and young in your 40s. You should be visionary in your 40s. When I was in my 40s, I was like, we can do it. We can do it. We can certainly do it. According to what I see in the scriptures, we can do something that we don't see nobody else doing. We can do it. We can follow the cloud and not the crowd and withstand all of the pressure from any group, any denomination, anybody around us who would dare say, you can't do it. We would say we can do it. Why? With God helping us. With God helping us. Your 40s. You're young. You need to have faith. And the older you get from that time on, if you're invested, your heat, your spiritual energy, your vigor, your fire should just increase. You know, this past week, Billy Graham died at 99. You know, a few months ago, actually this summer, Sharon and I got a chance to go to uh, Billy Graham's um, um, museum in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it was really, really inspiring to see how this man devoted his life to sharing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might say, well, Daryl, but he didn't teach exactly like us. That's not the point. He didn't teach exactly like us. That's not the point. Billy Graham preached about the man that I love more to anybody else in human history. And just because of that, you ought to respect and love Billy Graham. Because Billy Graham loved Jesus Christ and talked about Jesus Christ. And I respect that. I respect that. He kept his message very simple. Very, very simple. He just preached the gospel about the the negative impact that our sins have and about how Jesus Christ is a solution to our our greatest problem of sin. He was getting impatient. As we were going through the tour of the museum, the uh, the, the, the uh, museum curators and the different people who are giving uh, the tour would say, B- Bill, Billy Graham is just waiting to go home. After his wife died, he's just, he's blind, can't really do too much. 
and he wrote a book that basically said, I can't, I can't wait to go home, was basically the book. Wow. He spent his life talking about Jesus Christ. You know, if God gives me years, I'm going to be like that. I want to talk about Jesus to the day I die. When you're all in, that's what you're excited about. Still young. But the older I get, the more fire I have. The Bible it says, uh, when you are wholeheartedly invested, you won't retire from the vision of building up God's kingdom. If you're wholeheartedly invested. And that's really what we're talking about. We want the church to be invested. Not a few, not, 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 not the 20%, but the congregation. The congregation to be all in. I want to challenge you here this morning. If you're struggling your faith or in and out, if you, if you only come to church maybe twice a month and may every once in a while connect with, with disciples and maybe every quarter invite somebody to church and maybe six weeks go by and you have a really good quiet time. If you're kind of in and out on the fringe, I want to challenge you at, at your core to make a decision today to be invested, to be all in, to be wholehearted. Now, I'm going to share why a little bit. I'm going to share why. Their blessings. But let me go back to Joshua. So Caleb says son of Jephthah and gave him Hebron as a, so Joshua blessed Caleb son of Jephthah and gave him Hebron as his inheritance so Hebron has belonged to Caleb son of Jephthah and uh, Kenizzite ever since because he followed the Lord the God of Israel wholeheartedly Hebron used to be called Kirath Arba and after, after Arba who was the greatest man among the Anakites then the land had rest from war. Caleb conquered the land. The land used to be called Arba because of the Anakites were there. The Anakites were huge. But because Caleb had a vision of what God can do, they, they, not, they just totally changed the name of the country. Why? Because Caleb took it over. Caleb conquered the land. And then the land had its rest. And I believe because of the land had its rest, when Caleb was done, then Caleb went home to his God, a man who was fully invested. Now, why should you be wholehearted invested? Because God will reward your wholehearted faith. God rewards those who are wholehearted in their faith. You know, one of the things that faith does is faith is not only believing in God, but it's believing that God will reward everyone who has faith in him. It's not just saying God exists. That's part of faith. God exists. But the part of faith that God wants us to have is that part that says, God, you exist and I trust that you will reward me if I obey you. That's, that's the faith part that we need. I believe everybody in here would say God exists. But the part that we struggle with is, does God reward? I'm here to say God exists and God rewards. If you're wholehearted. God exists and God rewards if you're wholehearted. And God will reward your investment to his vision. And this is the part that we have to have faith. This is where wholehearted faith comes in. If you invest in God's vision, God will reward you and give you the land. An inheritance that you can't even think of. This is the faith that we need to have as a church. 
We need faith that says, if I do this, if I give that, if I am this, then God will bless me more than I can even ask for or imagine. God will reward you. I said, Daryl, it doesn't feel like God's rewarding me. I have invested. Listen, sometimes you don't even recognize the blessings that are right smack in front of you. God has protected you from things that you don't even know he's protected you from. Now, God will show you when you get to heaven one day of how he blessed your life all along. So instead of saying, oh, I'm still waiting on my blessing, I'm still waiting on my blessing, you're going to find out when you get to heaven just how much God has blessed you during your times where you felt like you were in famine of God's blessing. You don't even recognize how many enemies were defeated. Spiritual enemies, spiritual forces were defeated right there at your side. How God protected you from mess. Can I get an amen at that point? God has protected you from going places that you probably wanted to go, but you didn't even go because God put a hedge around you, around you and said, I'm not going to let you sin. Sometimes many of you guys probably wanted to sin, but you couldn't sin because God stopped you from sinning and making a mess out of your life. Can anybody give that testimony? You wanted to say something. Everything inside of you wanted to go off. But God zipped up your mouth and prevented you from saying that thing that would have messed up your job, messed up your family, messed up your marriage. God's protected you and he's protected me. And not only that, God has showered you with his blessings. Some of you guys, you probably would be dead right now, but God has extended your life. He's gave you more time. Not because your friends, your high school friends have been dropping like that, but you're still here. Can anybody give that testimony? Why you? Your family members, some are younger than you, have died. But why are you still here? You've been living a blessing of God and we need to worship him and praise his holy name and glorify and honor the incredible, gracious God. God will reward you if you invest in him. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say vision works. We've been praying about this building. We got it. We got it. Thursday. Thursday. We sat around the table with the attorneys, with our commercial realtors, with pen in hand. We, we were just signing paperwork, transferring ownership to DC Regional. It was, it was, I'm sorry, I get a little emotional here. It was just a miracle. It was watching a miracle happen in front of your eyes. Now, we, we can't have the whole church around the signing table, okay? We can't do that. But I appreciate Carlos Tron being there and Abu, Ray, Ed. Because vision works. Now, this is not everything. It's not the end of all. We're only getting started. I almost, I'm going to emphasize that. This is just the beginning. But when you come to the Red Sea, and it opens up and you walk across dry ground, and then you come to the Jordan River, and it opens up and you walk across dry ground, you got to stop and get those rocks. You got to go, let me grab a rock right now. Because somebody one day is going to want to celebrate. 
This is the time right now, as a church, to stoop down and get a rock. So you can tell the story of how God blesses and rewards wholehearted faith. See, where God guides, the Holy Spirit will be side by side. Remember we talked about that this fall? Remember we talked about how where God guides, the Lord will provide. Sometimes you go, I mean, I can't, uh, I can't wait to tell the story. There's no way in the world we should be having this building. It was listed initially for $5 million. Our price range, we were hoping to get something for maybe 1.3 or something like that. That, that's what we're trying to figure out. There's not a bank in this world that would ever loan us that kind of money. Sometimes as a church, we, we go from, there's been seasons, and we're only a couple of seasons away from just living check to check as a church. There's one, there's one time this fall when we were having the greater our vision, there are people, longstanding members leaving. Some people are like, y'all crazy? There are people who are like, wait a minute, what's going on? The church is falling apart. The church is falling apart. I'm like, vision works. Vision works. But wait a minute. Daryl, are you kidding me? We're shrinking. Vision works. So, some wise man told me, Daryl, you got to shrink first. Don Wilson told me about two years ago, Daryl, your church is too big. Can you get it smaller so you can have some fighting weight? I'm like, okay, I'm good at that. I'm good at getting this smaller, Don. <laughs> so you need to get to your fighting weight. You need, to, you need to know who is with you, who is all in, and that God sometimes, just through his providence, just allows this group to form. I'm saying you need to write your name down. Your name's going to go on the foundation of this church as a new beginning, as a charter member, as another new beginning of D.C. Regional Christian Church. But you're going to be able to look back in the future and go, I can't believe what God did. And it's you. It's you. To Daryl, not me. I'm one of those weak brothers. I'm one of the weak sisters. Listen, I don't care. So Daryl, are you going to punch me because I'm, I'm just one of these ban um, bandwagon Christians? No, jump on the bandwagon. We're not going to make you feel bad. So really? So I mean, I wouldn't. I would. I was a naysayer. Just jump on. Jump on. It's okay. It's okay. God wants us all. This is not my victory. This is our victory. This is God's victory. This is something that God is doing through all of us together. We're not going to punish anyone. Jump on board. Why? Because you know what? Sometimes my faith is not where it shouldn't have been. But God was carrying me the whole time. Sometimes fear, doubt, worry were getting in my, in my way, but God protected me. He helped me. Sometimes my sin could have stopped everything, but God says, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in using weak leaders. So people won't give more honor to you than to the God that you are representing before your church. For God, guys, the Lord will provide. You know, we took up a contribution in December and basically that was our way to see if the church was that, just what the church wanted and, and you guys, you gave. You, you, you gave. It was like real quick, let's, we're going to need that money and some, we didn't get what we needed to get at the time, but it was enough. Now we're going to have to have some, a special contribution like we normally have in the springtime to really pay for it. I mean, it's, it's in our name right now, but... There, there, there are some responsibilities that we need, and we're going to have to ask the church to invest, especially as we come up in the next um, couple of months. But I'm not even worried about that, because I've seen what God can do. Where God guides, the Lord will provide. Where God guides, you got to prepare for a wild ride. We talked about that this fall. I'm here to say, if you want the inside scoop of how everything happened, it was a wild ride. Not, sometimes it's hard, just, it's hard enough just trying to get a home sometime. This was a wild ride. It wasn't a merry-go-round. This wasn't a Ferris wheel. This was a slingshot. 
where God guides, our pride must die. This is one of the things I'm always conscious of. See, where God says, you know what, first of all, not once did we pray, God, as a leadership, God, give us this building. Lord, we want this building. I'm here to say, I can honestly say, we didn't, as a leadership team, not pray one prayer where we said, God, can we have this church building? Can we have this facility? Not one prayer. Not one. I talked to everybody. I talked to all, all, all the representatives of the leadership team. Not one of them. Not one of us said, God, can you give us? It was within the last week or two, we, we were going to walk away. Because all we wanted to do is, Lord, which way should we go? Our prayer is, God, just make it clear. If this is what you want, make it clear. If this is the path that you're, you're guiding us down, light that path. Make it obvious. If this is going to result in your glory and a lot of people become Christians, then, then make it obvious. Because we can stay here, we can move there. It's our, we are not a building. We are the church, the people. And then God made it so obvious. So many affirmations. Let me tell you the miracle. We're still short on some cash. But you know, we went into closing, not even having a checkbook, and signed a bunch of paperwork, and walked away with an over $5 million loan. 3.3, uh, 3.5 for the church, and then we got approved for a 1.8 renovation construction loan on top of that. Without even bringing a checkbook. Because of what God has been doing through the years. Honoring faith and wholeheartedness. And your sacrifice. So that, Daryl, that doesn't make sense. But remember I talked about that at the beginning of this year? I want to live a Holy Spirit driven life. A kind of life that won't make sense any other way other than by saying, well, it's clearly God did that. So we're going to give him glory. Where God guides, our pride must die. Meaning, that it's not about me. It's about God. It's about living out the, the role that God has given us. I told everybody, listen, make sure your heart don't get puffed up. But give glory to God. You tell the story and tell about what God has done. Through you. Now, I'm going to brag about you. Because I know the specific work that you have done. But when people brag on you, just receive it. But just give glory to God. Give glory to God. Our pride must die where God guides. And here's the last one. Where God guides, his grace will be supplied. And that's going to be the end of these four points, five points. Where God, got, where God guides, his grace will be supplied. As we move forward, I want to make sure D.C. Regional... Our new D.C. Regional Ministry Center will be a place of grace. A place of grace. I'm going to try to stay away from church. I really want to describe the facility as more of a ministry center. Because not only the, the, our vision still has to expand, you know, one of the miracles of this whole thing is we still own our college park a facility. We didn't even have to give that up. We're multi-church right now with two, uh, two, two, uh, two assets, two buildings, us. That's a miracle of God. We didn't have to mortgage that away or give that away. I said, Lord, this is your way of saying, I want you to be regional. And then don't, don't fall in love with Suitland. That's just all ministry center. That's all it is. It's a ministry center. A place of grace. I want to end a couple of different things. Paul said, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race, to complete the task the Lord has given me. The task of testifying to the good news or the gospel of God's grace. How his grace is sufficient. How his grace will be preached. 
So I don't care where you're at in your life. If you're struggling, if you've been hurting, if you feel like uh, I've been a disappointment, don't worry about that. God's grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in weakness. Don't worry about that. God accepts you just as you are, but he doesn't want to leave you right there. He wants to transform you into his likeness, but he accepts you just as you are. And he builds you up to take you where he wants you, where, where God wants to take you to be. So I don't want anybody here haunted by their past failures, struggling with guilt because of what you didn't do in the past. No, this ministry center is going to be a place of grace. And that place of grace starts right here with us. His grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in weakness. We're going to brag about God's grace. We're going to talk about God's grace, not as a license to sin, but as a way to be motivated to get this gospel out. See, when you understand grace, it changes your life. As it changed my life. When you see what God is doing, when the vision of God's grace is being explained to you, especially for the first time, it captivates you, it grabs you, it holds you. You can't explain it. It's grace. It's grace. One of those people in that picture right there, see the guy in the yellow shirt, kind of right by Barbara and by Ed Sam's. His name is Gary Edel. He's our commercial realtor. After seeing all this go through, Gary, our commercial realtor, realtor wrote a check to DC Regional for $2,500 just for the vision that he actually saw happen right in front of his eyes. Uh, people don't do this, I'm sorry. He says, Pastor Daryl, my wife and I were thinking, and, and I wrote this to you and Ray. Dear Daryl and Ray, congratulations on your purchase of 3701 St. Barnabas Road in Suitland. It has been my pleasure working with you on this transaction and seeing your vision for growth for DCRCC come to life. The members of DCRC are truly blessed to have the type of leadership that both you, Carlos, and Abu provide. I think the future of DCRCC is incredibly bright, and with your guidance, DCRCC is certain to provide a wonderful environment within which your congregants can pursue their spirituality. Because I was telling my wife how inspired I was by your passion for this project, and how much I have enjoyed working with such great people. My wife suggested that we make a donation to DCRCC. I thought that that was a great idea and attached, uh, you will find a check in the amount of $2,500 to be applied toward fundraising for the renovation of 3701 St. Barnabas Road. We hope this donation is helpful in bringing your vision for 3701 St. Barnabas Road and DCRCC to fruition. Although the transaction may be completed, I am always available to provide assistance and or consultation as you work through your renovation process and operational issues of managing the property. Please don't hesitate to call me or email me any questions, any time you need. And he says, I'm coming to the church, especially your grand opening. My family is going to be there. Grace. Got his heart. He captured a vision. Can I ask you today to invest in the vision? Invest in the vision. Our prayer is the same prayer that we asked a couple weeks ago. Is, Lord, increase my vision to see the eternal value of my investment. I still want that same prayer to be, Lord, help me to see the eternal value of investing in his vision. Right now, it's time for celebration. I've been telling people, it's got, there's so much work to do. I have a hard time celebrating. i got to force myself to celebrate. Because there's just so much work to do. But I have to force myself. you got to help me celebrate. It's time for celebration. It's time for celebration. And it's time for preparation. 
We got to be ready to see God do some amazing things. We need every single member here in this church to be on point, wholehearted in your devotion to see God's vision come true. This weekend, we have another leaders meeting. A few weeks ago, we had a leaders meeting um, on Saturday night. This coming week, uh, we're going to have another leaders meeting Saturday night. I believe it's at 7 o'clock at Brock Hall. Make, make sure you're there. You just say, Daryl, I'm not sure if I'm a leader, but well, you're invited to come. You're invited to come. We're going to talk about next steps. we got to celebrate, and then we got to prepare. It's time for celebration and preparation. Celebration and preparation. And we've got to be ready to see God do some absolutely amazing things. Let's go to our Father in prayer. My Father, as we stand in awe of how you move among us, sometimes when we see you act, it's actually frightening because we feel your presence, your holy presence. And some part of us just wants to say, woe to me. I'm a man of unclean lips. We recognize your holiness and your presence. Now, Father, as we stop and pick up a rock, as we celebrate, I pray that we'll celebrate by making a commitment to be fully invested in kingdom building, just like Caleb was. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's sure say amen.